Digital Technology Exports to ASEAN Part 4 is about intellectual property. This is one of the most highly anticipated topics for tech companies considering international trade and business. We will deep dive into the considerations when taking your IP offshore and discuss an overview of IP Australia, the ASEAN IP protection landscape, as well as practical tips. Our guest speaker is Sky Reeve, Assistant Director in the International Policy and Consideration and Trade and Policy Projects sections from IP Australia. Sky has over seven years experience at IP Australia, including two years working as a trades, trademarks examiner. IP Australia are the Australian government agency that administers intellectual property rights and legislation relating to patents, trademarks, designs and plant breeders rights in Australia. IP Australia has a strong interest in providing IP information to support Australians seeking to do business in the ASEAN region. Thank you very much, Sky, and over to you. Okay, so hello everyone. So as introduced, my name is Sky Reeve and I'm with IP Australia. So um, IP Australia, as said, uh, we administer uh, the registered intellectual property or IP rights in Australia. That includes trademarks, patents, designs, and plant breeders rights. Um, we don't have administrative responsibility for copyright just so you know. Um, the goal of this presentation is to give you an overview of um, IP so you can protect your business when engaging in international markets. There are risks to operating overseas and the key is to plan your IP strategy as early as possible. Be aware of your options. It will help to mitigate any risks rather than when considering IP only after it's too late. So as we mentioned, um, IP Australia takes a whole of government approach to the protection of IP. Uh, this means that we work with other agencies that have IP responsibility. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't have IP responsibility for copyright. That is now the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. We also work with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who have trade responsibility for IP matters. And the Department of Agriculture, Water Resources, and environment on geographical indications, and the Department of Home Affairs and our various courts oversee um, uh, intellectual property enforcement. So IP is generally not uh, protected automatically. So you will need to register your rights generally. So um, there are various ways that they can be protected. Um, the best way to protect your brand, for instance, is to register your trademark. As mentioned, um, other rights can include copyright and trade secrets, um, and these aren't necessarily registered. But uh, if you do have a trademark, patent, design, or plant breeder right, you will need to register them. We recommend that you register them with IP Australia. So this slide shows you how a company can leverage various types of IP to protect their brand, products, and business processes. In this example, uh, the company uses the full scope of IP mechanisms, including registered and non-registered rights for various elements of their business. So there's no one way. So you can see here that they registered their trademark, um, which they've done for both a plain word for ResMed and a logo mark. They registered the design, which is the visual appearance of the product. They have a patent, a registered patent. Um, and while, not a reg while registration isn't required for copyright or trade secrets, um, the copyright will protect any software, source code, product images, advertising copy, product manuals, things like that. Um, and as you know, trade secrets um, protect commercially valuable information, not disclosed in patents. So trademarks. So a brand can be the most valuable in IP a company has. A trademark is the IP right used to protect a brand. A trademark is a sign that distinguishes goods and services from those of others. What can be a sign is quite broad and includes a word, logo, shape, color, or combinations thereof. It must be distinctive and not descriptive. So different countries have different systems to protect their trademarks. Um, and these can be either what's known as um, first to file or first to use. So Australia has a first to use system. Um, and that means that whoever's the first to use a trademark will usually be uh, the person that has the first right to use that. Now, in first-to-file countries, that's different. It's the first, per first person or company or entity that actually files the trademark. And uh, this is different across the ASEAN nations. So it's important that you understand uh, 
the jurisdiction in which you're planning on trading in order to ensure that um, you've uh, considered, I guess, your best option. Um, I guess one of the big things about that is if you're looking at a, a nation that is a first to file nation um, and you haven't registered your trademark, somebody else can get there first. And even though they're not using your trademark, they will have a right that supersedes yours. So on that note, if you don't register your trademark and somebody sees maybe at a trade fair or some other way that you're promoting your, your brand that they think that it's actually something that's quite viable, you don't be surprised if somebody else has already registered your trademark in their country. If this happens, they can sue you for trademark infringement and sometimes even ask a lot of money for you to buy back your own trademark. This bad faith trademark filing, also called trademark squatting, um, can be a very big issue in some countries. Trademark squatters or hijackers register the other company's trademarks in order to seek a payout to sell the mark, as I mentioned, or to use it as a cover for counterfeit products. This is arguably the single most frequent IP issue affecting companies overseas. It affects huge successful companies such as Apple, Nike, and New Balance, and it affects Australian small businesses too. The only effective way to try to avoid this is to file trademarks in all first to file countries as soon as possible. So here's just a table of some of the filing systems of ASEAN countries. You'll see that most of them are actually first to file. Uh, the only two that, uh, you know, this is the current data that we have. The only two that seem to be first to use are Malaysia and Singapore. Note, uh, Myanmar is actually undergoing a change from first to use to first to file. So uh, you may, ne may need to seek specialized legal advice there. Moving on to patents and designs. So as I said before, patents protect inventions, how something works, while designs protect the visual appearance of a product. So applications for both these IP rights uh, must be new, meaning that you must file applications before the product is revealed to the public. If you have new products you haven't yet filed patent or design applications for, and you intend to do so, then play it safe by limiting what you display and file your applications as soon as possible. Now, of course, uh, some places have grace periods, meaning that you have a certain amount of time where you can have actually released uh, your product to uh, the public, but, and then you have a grace period from which then to file your application. So here's a table that gives a grace period list of ASEAN countries. Um, you can see pretty much they're all uh, 12 months except in Myanmar. Having said that, uh, we do obviously recommend that you get legal advice before you would actually make your product available publicly. And probably as a precaution, still probably keep it pretty close to your chest. Um, some of the grace periods, depending on different countries, may have certain regulations of where that, where you can actually show the product that would be contained within the grace period. So there can be some jurisdictional kind of specifications that might be um, specific to that territory or that country or that nation. So um, be very clear about where you're gonna be trading and, and when you're gonna put it public or else risk maybe losing the opportunity to be able to patent or get a registered design right for your product. So as I kind of uh, alluded to just before, IP rights are territorial. Uh, so you need to consider getting IP rights in all of the territories, nations, countries, jurisdictions where you're seeking to potentially trade. Um, this is really quite important um, when we go back to looking at trademarks especially and looking at first to file countries because we have found evidence that people do actually look online, search for trademarks that they think are very interesting or could be something that's coming to their country and then will actually file for those trademarks. So there have been a number of com uh, companies that have gone into first to file countries and you know, it's received a very disappointing surprise to find out that their trademarks have been registered. And then, as I mentioned before, you're in for kind of potentially a long and costly process to get that trademark back or to rebrand in those nations. Um, so copyright, I'll just, I'll just going back to copyright, obviously that's not what we administer, but I'll just, I know people have interest in it, so I'll throw a little bit in here and there where I can. So uh, copyright for literary and artistic works will generally apply automatically worldwide. Again, um, you'd need to probably seek uh, legal advice depending on where it is you're thinking of trading. Um, 
when you are looking at filing for an IP right in another jurisdiction, you have a couple of options generally. So one of them is that you can file directly to the office in that country, or another one, depending on the jurisdiction, you can consider using an international routing system. So the World Intellectual Property Organization, also known as WIPO, administers several international systems which are designed to make it easier to file for registration in multiple countries. So looking at international IP systems then. The Madrid system is for the international registration of trademarks. The Hague system is for the international registration of industrial designs. And the Patent Cooperation Treaty or PCT is for international registration of patents. Now the benefit to using the systems include that you can apply with one application in using one language, including English, uh, with one set of fees and in one currency, which is, is Frank's being that uh, WIPO is located in Geneva in Switzerland. Now it's also useful to consider having a registration in Australia on which to base your overseas application through any of these treaties. So the way that these work, with the exception of The Hague, to which Australia is not currently a member, is that you'll need uh, what they call a, a basic application or a home application in Australia. And from that application, you can then file for an international registration and you can designate which other countries you would like to receive uh, protection in. So uh, that's one thing you probably want to consider, that even if you're thinking about using one of these international registration systems, you may want to seek a registration first in Australia. Um, similar advantages exist in the management of the IP rate also. For example, uh, with these international routing mechanisms, if the registration has to be renewed or is going to be assigned to a third party, or when other changes such as name or address have to be recorded, you can still do it through that one system and it'll actually affect all the different international registrations that you have rather than having to go to each individual office and directly do that. Um, okay, so you know, before deciding which route to take, either direct filing or through international systems, uh, as I'll say probably for almost everything here, we recommend that you seek uh, professional legal advice before you do that. And here, hopefully this is useful. This is just an, um, a membership uh, chart to the international IP system. So I'll leave that for you guys to have a, a look at. Okay, so some practical tips. As I foreshadowed, consult an IP attorney. I don't think that we can uh, Recommend this enough. Uh, IP Australia uh, provides support and information regarding IP in Australia and, and for uh, IP, uh, sorry, Australian businesses and SMEs and individuals, but we do not provide legal or business advice. So you will need to think about uh, engaging um, an IP uh, professional. Uh, one way to do this is to uh, you start off by looking at the Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys of Australia, also known as IPTA. There's some details there. Um, you can find a trademarks attorney in your city easily enough. There's lots of us. Uh, many trademarks attorneys will give a free initial consultation. Uh, would ask when making an appointment and consider shopping around uh, to find someone who understands your business well. They can work with associates on your trademark st strategy. And so just a little, to add on to this a little bit as well, if you're planning on trading in the ASEAN region, you're gonna probably wanna find someone with some experience in whatever jurisdiction you are looking to trade in. I mean, each of these are obviously gonna be um, a little bit specialized. So ensure that wherever you're planning on trading or exporting to or doing business in, that the person that you're speaking with here either knows that industry or that country, but also knows, or I, or that, or also knows somebody um, in that country that they can direct you to for those types of uh, specialized questions. As a bit of a, a cautionary reminder, if a business partner, distributor, or someone else offers to do it for you in one of these countries, uh, particularly in overseas jurisdictions, reconsider. Okay, for trademarks, think about registering your trademark in English, as well as the language of where you're applying. This may include characters and phonetic equivalents. Consider searching existing databases for IP rights in Australia through IP Australia's website and in ASEAN countries. ASEAN TM view, which is uh, here on the slide, is useful for searching trademarks in the region. 
Now, a self-search will have its limitations, obviously, but it can at least give you some useful preliminary information. Uh, your trademark attorney can then do a professional search. WIPO also hosts a number of useful databases, including Patent Scope, which allows you to search patents internationally and filter by geographical regions such as ASEAN. Um, I'd also suggest that you consider domain name registration. Again, that's not really our area of specialty, but um, you know, obviously if you get a domain name here, you might find that somebody else has registered it in the country that you're seeking to trade in, or they might have registered a domain name for your trademark. Um, so these are things you're gonna wanna watch out for. So I think that this is a really important um, tip for people that are trading in overseas countries, considering language, considering domain names, considering translations, transliterations. We've seen time and time again that somebody will go in and register uh, the English trademark, the English word, and then in those countries, they've actually, somebody else has then gone ahead and registered the trademark in the language of that country. And it's very difficult to get that back, especially in first to file countries, as I've mentioned before. Yet another area that's not really our specialization, but we found is quite useful for people, and I'm sure other people have also discussed this as well, but um, contracts. You're going to need to be aware of contracts. I think that goes without saying. Now, contract issues aren't limited to IP, obviously, but we see issues around contracts so often that we, as I said, think it's useful to mention. Um, Australians doing business overseas uh, often use poor contracts that fail to protect their interests. Other countries' legal systems are different to ours, and engage, the need to engage local lawyers to localize countries in each country, sorry, to localize contracts in each country is very important. Uh, this includes any business deals or non-disclosure agreements. As I said before, please be wary if somebody else offers to do all that for you. It may seem like, a, you know, it's like, great, you'll take something off my hands, but don't be surprised if you don't really understand the nuances of maybe what's in the contract and that can come back to burn you. Uh, you should ensure your contracts have been drafted by, or at a minimum, uh, received by a lawyer in the jurisdiction that you are looking to operate in. Here, you'll also want to consider bilingual contracts to ensure all parties understand the terms of the agreement. Um, just a note that IP Australia also has an IP contract generator on our website, which may assist you, and we recommend at least have a good look. Okay, monitoring and enforcement. So your intellectual property is only as good as your enforcement. If you have an IP right and you can't enforce it, it's not really much use. Um, so your IP rights are pro uh, private rights. So as an IP owner, you will be responsible for enforcing your own IP rights. It's not the responsibility of the Australian government. As I said before, uh, we provide support, guidance, information, but as it's a private right, uh, the Australian government doesn't enforce it on behalf of IP rights owners. Um, we suggest in that case that you need to monitor online and physical markets and enforce your rights against infringers. So uh, legal advisors can assist you to gather evidence and stop action to, uh, sorry, take action to stop the infringement. So, I mean, there are, there are services that provide monitoring services for you. It's something that you can do to be checking the register all the time, but this is a very important part of having your IP right. It's, just, it's not just registration, you walk away from it. Uh, keep an eye on it, make sure other people aren't infringing it, using it, uh, and consider what you need to do should you find somebody else infringing your right. Um, enforcement is baking, uh, being taken very seriously in the ASEAN region. As part of their IP rights action plan in 2016 to 2025, ASEAN members will, among other strategies, expand their information awareness activities on enforcement, including with coordination mechanisms and workshops and symposia, increase publicly available statistical information on IP enforcement, reduce movements of pirated and counterfeited goods between countries, draw on best practice for enforcement to strengthen national internal guidelines, and IP Australia, we are also uh, looking more deeply into the challenges in registering and enforcing IP rights overseas. To help Australian exporters uh, and businesses with any challenges that exist, we have commenced a large body of work to scope initiatives and increase support, including through a streamlined enforcement ecosystem. Research began, began late last year through a survey of Australian businesses and their experience registering or protecting their IP in China and Southeast Asia. So our uh, initial analysis, I'll share some of that with you if you're interested, um, 
indicates that most respondents operating in Southeast Asia and China had an understanding of IP, with most having registrations for trademarks followed by patents then designs. Some also rely on copyright. About a third of the respondents have been involved in IP-related issue or dispute, and from those who had IP-related issues, 44% indicated that someone infringed their registered IP, including around 10% by their business partner or distributor. So you'll see that that's, that's a pretty big number. Respondents strongly rely on IP Australia's website by 39%, and followed by Oz Industry at 20%, and Export Support Services again at 20%. It's important for us to have this evidence to be able to create meaningful and sustainable policies to address any issues that are evident. Um, and just one other thing I'd like to add on this is that uh, as an IP office, IP Australia engages with ASEAN IP offices through the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement or ANSFTA. Strong personal relationships have been critical as we have worked together in building IP standards in the region. We just passed the 10 year mark for the agreement last year. In that time, we have supported members of the ASEAN region to accede to and implement the Madrid Protocol, increase the quality of patent examination in the region, and contributed to public awareness about the importance of protecting and respecting IP. This is an area that IP Australia is interested in, and we look forward to being able to provide additional support and guidance for those wanting to trade in that region. Okay, rounding up then. Things to consider uh, and things to remember. Register your IP to protect your business and consult an Australian IP attorney where necessary. Register IP rights in all the relevant markets, Australia and overseas. Consider the international IP system for a more streamlined approach to registration. Get your contracts, non-disclosure agreements and business agreements right. Consider due diligence on potential partners early. Consult local attorneys in foreign markets. Monitor and enforce your IP. For further resources and report, uh, support, please see our website. We've got some good information there for you. We plan on up, keeping that up to date as possible. There's some more information there for you. Obviously, this would be the time normally to have questions. Thanks so much. Thank you.